Hello, everybody. It is my pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar on Advanced Brain Tumor Imaging presented by Professor Marco Essig and hosted by Olea Medical. So first, we will have a short technical point. All your mics will be muted, but I will be taking your questions via chat and I will submit, that, uh, I will submit them to Dr. Essig at the end of the presentation. With that, it is my pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Essig, Chair of the Radiology Department of the University of Manitoba. Dr. Esif has an extensive expertise in neuroradiology and has an impressive research record on advanced imaging for diagnosis of neurovascular diseases and tumors and neurodegenerative disorders. Today, Dr. Esif will discuss advanced brain tumor imaging. Dr. Esif, uh, you can start when you're ready. Yes, thank you very much for the kind introduction. <clears throat> and today, uh, the seminar is focusing on brain tumor imaging and advanced brain tumor imaging. And because we have only limited amounts of time, I will mainly focus on diffusion weighted imaging and perfusion imaging using different perfusion techniques. I have nothing to disclose and we'll go right into uh, um, the topic. And so the requirements and goals of CNS imaging, they are multiplex and they can be very difficult because imaging is almost involved in every step of the patient's journey uh, through um, the hospital. So before therapy, we are working up a lesion, we are looking at the lesion extent, we are looking for complications, uh, we look for a differential diagnosis, uh, and of course, grading of a tumor if we detect um, and visualize a tumor. And if the patient then goes to a therapy, uh, imaging is again involved, and uh, we have to help with the treatment decision. Uh, we have to look into best approach and best delineation for surgery or radiotherapy. And uh, we can use theragnostics to combine our imaging findings with other diagnostic tools, which will impact the therapeutic management of the patient. And then if the patient has been treated, is on follow-up, we are again looking um, to use imaging for the follow-up of uh, the therapy response. And of course, to identify and to visualize and monitor uh, treatment-related side effects. So it's very complex and we have developed over the last couple of years a number of functional imaging tools to improve those uh, diagnostic requirements in brain tumor imaging. So we have introduced MR spectroscopy. We are using on a regular basis diffusion and diffusion tensor imaging. We have almost um, included brain perfusion imaging in all of our protocols for brain tumor workup. Um, we are using diffusion tensor imaging, tractography to visualize uh, the tracts and the relation of the tumor to those tracts. Uh, and we can uh, use functional imaging fMRI to localize higher uh, cognitive or motor or other centers uh, in relation to the tumor. So we have quite a, a large armory here and uh, we are using it as well. We are using it in all the three scenarios. So for example, we are using advanced MRI, like MR spectroscopy uh, and perfusion imaging in the pre-therapeutic workup to get a better diagnosis, differential diagnosis, as well as grading. And we use it regularly in the therapeutic management of patients, like diffusion tensor imaging, tractography, functional MRI or functional CT um, uh, for better treatment planning and treatment management. And we use those tools also for the follow-up management of patients uh, specifically to differentiate between tumor related changes and treatment related changes. If you're looking uh, into diffusion, the principles are fairly old and are used in many uh, neuroradiology questions because if we have an environment without restriction, the water molecules can move freely. But if there's a cellular environment um, and um, the movement of the free water uh, is restricted uh, by the surroundings and we see a so-called restricted diffusion. Uh, to visualize that, we obtain diffusion images with different B values, where B represents the different levels of diffusion, and then we calculate the apparent diffusion coefficient, the ADC. We map those and uh, they represent um, the restricted diffusion uh, over space. So cellular areas like tumor infiltration will show more diffusion restriction because there's less space in between the cells which allow the water to freely move. 
Um, on the other side, uh, areas of vasogenic edema will have higher ADC values because the water molecules are not restricted uh, by the high uh, cellularity. So uh, this can be used uh, in stroke imaging, but can also be helpful in the assessment uh, of brain lesions, because if we have a high cellular density, uh, which often reflects um, um, like a high grade of a tumor, an aggressive tumor, or specific tumors with a high cellular density, like lymphomas or some of the metastases, uh, that can be of use for differential diagnosis, as well as for treatment planning. Uh, so here we see a patient with multiple rim-enhancing intraaxial mass lesions. The patient has a known primary, so we suspect that this is metastatic disease. Um, you see here the enhancement pattern, the T2 patterns. And then if we apply uh, diffusion-rated imaging, we see that there is restricted diffusion specifically uh, along the um, enhancing margins of those lesions, uh, which is the active lesion part where there's really a cellular, high cellular density and a lot of um, growth happening. And so those areas are restricting. Um, that is a very important uh, tool also to better delineate those lesions, which can be helpful for treatment planning, for example. Uh, here's a patient with a glioblastoma. Uh, here the T2 flare changes, the contrast enhancement, and if we add perfusion and uh, diffusion first, first diffusion, we see that uh, there's areas of restricted diffusion uh, in parts of the tumor. And those are the highly cellular parts of the tumor, which we have learned are the most aggressive parts of the tumor. And these findings uh, are also seen not only um, in diffusion rated scans, they are also seen on MR spectroscopy. Here's a spectrum from that highly cellular part of the tumor. You see that there's a high choline, uh, so a high marker for membrane turnover. We have low NAA, so already a lot of the normal neuronal tissue is replaced by uh, tumor tissue. And we do see a, lac a small lactate peak, which gives us information that there's a necrosis happening. And if we then add perfusion into the concept, we see that uh, those areas with Low ADC, they also show high perfusion values because those are the areas which have built a neovasculature that show high CBV, high CBF, um, and have a high malignant uh, potential. So all of the information is very important for the differential diagnosis, uh, for treatment management, and then later on will be important for the follow-up of those patients after treatment. So uh, beside having diffusion weighted imaging, we also can use the diffusion information in diffusion tractography, uh, diffusion tensor imaging, uh, to visualize the tracts and how they relate uh, to a tumor. And uh, this is what we provide these days to our neurosurgeons. It's a 3D reconstruction of the uh, diffusion maps in relation to the tumor. So the patient has a frontal lobe tumor here. And the diffusion information diffusion tensor information with the tracts is overlaid onto those anatomic images uh, for treatment planning and for risk assessment for the surgeon. And you can clearly see how the tumor is infiltrating the tracts and the surgeon can now estimate the damage that he will cause by resecting that tumor. So it's not that the tracts are displaced in this case, they are really infiltrated and uh, it, this is very helpful information for the surgeon in his risk assessment uh, for surgery and to talk to the patient about potential uh, neurologic deficits after surgery. We use these days uh, the diffusion information also for an estimation of infiltration. The raw data from the diffusion tensor imaging is the fractional anisotropy. So the fractional anisotropy is fairly well-defined in anatomic areas. And here we looked, in this study, we looked at the corpus callosum. So we have five different areas along the corpus callosum. Um, and this um, area, like this fractional anisotropy, is very typical over multiple healthy volunteers. If you now have a patient with tumors, you see the tumor here is presented in both hemispheres. It's an oligodendroglioma. Um, 
The patient has, however, no visible infiltration into the corpus callosum. So the corpus callosum seems free, but if you look at the fractional anisotropy, in this case, we see that the FA has already dropped below normal values, which is a clear sign of an infiltration of a disintegration of the fibers uh, crossing the corpus callosum, um, which we uh, interpret as a tumor infiltration, which is not visible on uh, standard imaging, but on so-called functional imaging using fractional anisotropy. So the next method I would like to talk about and actually spend most of the time is on perfusion imaging. So perfusion is physiologically quite well described. It's the blood flow through the specific volume of tissue per unit of time. We have three techniques to measure perfusion with MRI. We can use so-called exogenous contrast, dynamic susceptibility contrast enhanced, and dynamic contrast enhanced uh, imaging. So here we inject the contrast from external and we use uh, the hemodynamics of the contrast uh, to calculate different perfusion values. We also can use the plot as an intrinsic contrast, which is called endogenous contrast. Um, and that's what we call arterial spin labeling. Here we label the blood with a specific pulse and we follow that labeled blood through the area of interest and can also calculate perfusion values. In this case, predominantly the cerebral blood flow uh, through a tissue unit. Now, both is possible. However, in brain tumors, we predominantly use the so-called ex exogenous contrast techniques. First of all, because we give contrast media anyways. And second, it's less time consuming. So arterial spin labeling is very time consuming and it's also uh, like it has a high sensitivity uh, amongst motion. Uh, so in that long acquisition time, the patient really needs to hold still and um, uh, there's a high risk that uh, the uh, imaging or the perfusion imaging is non-diagnostic. Therefore, in brain tumors, we predominantly use these upper two techniques. So what are the indications for perfusion imaging in brain tumors? <clears throat> In general, we look at stroke imaging. And in brain tumor imaging, we use DSC perfusion as a standard. Uh, we use dynamic contrast enhancement perfusion in an advanced setting. And we are more and more using so-called combined protocols. In some of our protocols, we use perfusion also in the assessment of neurodegenerative diseases, but in those patients, we don't give contrast media regularly. So therefore, most of the time, arterial spin labeling is used. So going a little bit into the technical details of perfusion with exogenous contrast. So one of the techniques I have described is dynamic contrast enhanced imaging. In this method, we just follow the bolus of contrast through the tissue while acquiring multiple gradient echo sequences. And out of the data that we get, the so-called signal intensity time curve, we can extract information about vascularity of the lesion and vessel permeability if we have an excretion of contrast media into the tissue, which we have in brain tubes. Uh, we either use half or the standard dose of a gadolinium-based contrast media. And what we can get is then a color-coded map of the different parameters. In this case, information about vascularity and vessel permeability. And what you can see here is that an, on the standard imaging, very homogeneous appearing tumor is actually not homogeneous. It has different areas. So there's an area anterior here, which has high colors, which means it is uh, higher perfuse, it has a higher vascularity and a higher permeability. So this is what we learned from different studies uh, and histological confirmation, the most aggressive part of the tumor. Even it appears homogeneous on uh, the conventional imaging. This is important information for the management of patients. Uh, in dynamic susceptibility weighted uh, MRI, DSC, which is the most commonly used, we uh, use the surrogate parameters for perfusion, CBV, and CBF. We acquire T2 star weighted scans, 
EPI normally um, at a more higher frequency. And we also inject contrast media at a bolus of half a dose or a single dose. And again, here you have a homogeneous non-enhancing tumor in this case. Uh, and if you apply the perfusion information, in this case, it's CBV, you see that there is a hot spot in the center of the tumor, which has a higher blood volume uh, than the rest of the tumor. So this is an area which either has already malignant transformation or has a very specific blood supply. And this should be the target, for example, for a biopsy, because this is likely to be the highest rate of the tumor. So in brain tumors, <clears throat> what can perfusion imaging help us with? Well, it can help us to rule out a tumor. <clears throat> we have to give a differential diagnosis for brain lesions, and some of them might not be tumor. So we can differentiate between tumor and non-tumoral tissue. If we have a tumor, we can use perfusion imaging for tumor grading. Uh, we can use it for treatment decision and timing of treatment. For example, if we differentiate between low and high-grade tumors, uh, a low-grade tumor is more that we watch and wait, uh, but a high-grade tumor needs to undergo immediate treatment. Uh, we can use it for biopsy and treatment planning to get, for example, the most malignant part of the tumor. And we can use it for treatment follow-up. So this is a case where <clears throat> we use perfusion imaging to differentiate between tumor and non-tumorous tissue. Uh, in this patient, uh, there was a brain lesion diagnosed, patient had seizures. Uh, the lesion is really not enhancing, but it also has no increased perfusion. So in this case, um, no enhancement as said, uh, perfusion and uh, with blood volume, blood flow are normal. So this is likely not a tumor. This is a cortical dysplasia. Um, and so this is important information because this is a lesion that can just be watched. There's no real uh, treatment option unless you resect it uh, for, uh, to control the seizures. Uh, this is another patient where we added uh, perfusion imaging into the differential diagnostic workup. This is a patient who had a surgery before, uh, had already a low-grade uh, tumor um, diagnosed, has a recurrency at the posterior border of the resection cavity and a little bit at the anterior border of the resection cavity. Um, and um, it's a very homogeneous tumor. Uh, however, uh, we want to know, is this still a low grade or is it a high grade? Because those patients are managed differently. And if we add the perfusion, we can see that there is an area of high blood volume and blood flow, uh, which is representing a high um, tumor grade. Um, so this patient um, was diagnosed with a high grade tumor, got surgery um, and a completely different uh, treatment as if it would have been a low grade tumor. This is a kind of a summary slide at the beginning. Before I go into details and show you a couple of examples, where we um, have uh, different grades of tumor, like we have a grade two, grade three, and grade four. And you can see that um, there are very classical findings in MR spectroscopy. So from an almost normal spectrum, we are going to a more and more malignant spectrum. So NAA will go down because that normal neuronal uh, tissue is replaced by tumor. And then with high-grade tumors, we get lactate because there's more and more tumor necrosis. Uh, but also the perfusion changes. So if you look at CBV, for example, uh, you see that with increase of uh, the grade, we see more um, increased blood flow here assessed with ASL and blood volume here assessed with uh, DSC. And also the permeability um, of mapping of the tumor changes because we have contrast exorization and we have a higher vascularity within uh, the tumor tissue. Okay, let's look at a few examples. So this is a 55 year old woman presenting with blurred vision and pressor sensation at the back of her head. A flare finds a tumor tissue. There is a little bit of gadolinium enhancement within that lesion. And again here, central enhancement, larger flare changes. Um, and then the question is, is this a low grade or is it a high grade tumor? Uh, diffusion imaging shows a little bit of restricted diffusion. So that's suspicious for a high cellular density. Spectroscopy shows a high choline, 
um, low NAA and presence of lactate. So this is a clear indicator that this is likely already a high grade tumor. And then if we add perfusion, you see that there is a high blood volume, which is very classical for a high grade tumor. And the patient was diagnosed with a glioblastoma. Not strong enhancing, very mild enhancing, but classical uh, glioblastoma on histology. Another case of a 20 year old male with complex partial seizures. And you see here a lesion at the medial temporal lobe on the left, uh, predominantly seen on flare. Not a lot of enhancement, actually, no enhancing tumor. Uh, this is actually from our OLEA platform that's done automatically uh, by the systems. It's done on the, uh, not on the scanner, but on the workstation. The scanner automatically sends the data to the workstation. The workstation does the processing, and we can either choose to look at the workstation or even we have a setup that the results are sent to our uh, email so that we can assess um, the tumor from everywhere where we are reading, from home or from uh, in hospital. Um, and here on that platform, you see that there is already a, a fairly high blood flow within that lesion. Also, the blood volume was fairly high. Um, and so here we have a glial tumor with already suspected anaplastic transformation based on the perfusion information uh, that gives us the information that blood flow and blood flow are higher than what we expect for a low-grade tumor. Here we have another scenario. This is a patient who had a low-grade astrocytoma who was treated quite a few, uh, quite a time back. And the question is, is this new enhancing area now treatment response or treatment related? Uh, or is this a malignant transformation of the initially low-grade tumor? Like the case before, new area, but here we have enhancement and the patient had, of course, aggressive prior treatment. So we did perfusion imaging and you see that there's a high blood volume here. And that high blood volume is very indicative that this is not treatment related, that this is tumor related and that we have a malignant transformation in that case. These situations can be fairly complex, especially if you're in the first six months after combined radio and theme, uh, chemotherapy, specifically the chemotherapy with temozolomid. So here you see a patient that has a large resection cavity. Um, that's the follow-up scan six months after, um, and the patient has developed multiple areas of enhancement surrounding that resection cavity. So the key question is, is this treatment related or is it tumor related or is it even both? And if we add the perfusion information, that is really helpful. So this anterior nodule here that you see here has high blood volume. So this is suspicious, <clears throat> sorry. Uh, this is suspicious of being a high-grade component recurrent tumor which grows at the border of the resection cavity. So this should be a target either of a re-resection or additional treatment. The area posterior, which is really ugly looking here and fairly large, has actually reduced perfusion, low blood volume, low blood flow, which is a very typical finding of a treatment-related side effect. And so here in this case, we had two areas, very complex, both enhancing, but one was recurrent tumor and the other one was just treatment related side effects, so-called pseudoprogression. The same here in this case, where the patient had again, combined radiotherapy and temozolomide, and there was a significant increase of the residual tumor after treatment. So the question, is this pseudoprogression or is it true progression? Of course, we can wait another few weeks uh, and then we see that the lesion is shrinking. So it was actually pseudoprogression. But we can also look at the perfusion imaging and perfusion shows that at the second follow-up, uh, despite the fact that the tumor was increasing substantially, we do see a loss or a drop in the perfusion values. CBV and CBF dropped both. 
And this is a clear sign for a so-called pseudoprogression or treatment-related side effect. Uh, and here um, we see on the follow-up that blood volume and blood flow remains low. So this is a patient uh, which is has the same kind of scenario. It's a 45-year-old female that had previous resection of her oligoastrocytoma grade 2. So what we see here is that there is an increasing area of T2 hyperintensity um, slowly over time. And the key question you see it here on the temporal lobe, the key question is, is this now treatment related or is it tumor related? If you look at the perfusion imaging here, you can already see that there is a higher perfusion value here um, that is very su suspicious of being uh, tumor related and not treatment related because in treatment related changes, we would not see an increase in the blood volume. We won't expect a neovasculature. Uh, so here we have a recurrent glial tumor with suspected anaplastic transformation. Fairly similar scenario, 54 year old male with previous resection of an oligodendroglioma. And again, we do see at the border of the resection cavity an increasing area of T2 hyperintensity. It's increasing over time. It develops not a real mass effect because the patient can compensate because of its large um, resection cavity. But if you look at the details of the perfusion imaging down here, uh, that's again from our OLEA platform, which gives us all the information, anatomic information, as well as perfusion information, different perfusion um, uh, values. Um, you see that this lesion, different from the previous one, shows low blood volume and blood flow. So this is actually treatment-related side effect and not tumor-related. So no neovasculature, no increased blood volume, treatment-related side effect uh, in a patient with a low-grade astrocytoma or oligodendroglioma. So here we have radiation-induced tissue changes and not recurrent tumor. The second method, <clears throat> which um, I would also briefly touch on, um, is the so-called dynamic contrast-enhanced imaging technique, which looks at the signal intensity time curve over time. So it only works in enhancing lesions because we need to have that extravasation and contrast media uptake information. And in this case, we have two patients um, with similar histology, both are glioblastomas, both had previous surgery or partial resection. And here you see a um, small residual lesion here along the ventricular wall. You have a fairly large lesion, it's the dominant hemisphere, so there was um, uh, some substantial tumor left by the surgeon. Um, the question is now, are, like they are both histologically um, glioblastomas, but are they behaving the same? And the signal intensity time curve information extracted from our DCE imaging, uh, D, uh, uh, DSC, dynamic uh, contrast enhanced DCE, can give us um, a little bit more information. So here, for example, this tumor, which is large, strong enhancing, shows a classical tumor enhancement, signal intensity time curve. The other lesion here um, is different because it's compared to a more hypervascular, a hypervascular tumor, which we see has a very steep increase, a plateau, and then even a loss of contrast media over time out of the tumor. So this is a hypervascular, suspicious, very high aggressive tumor. This is a so-called hypervascular tumor. And if you look at the follow-up, so six months after therapy, this was a fairly good response. Patient remained stable. The other patient, the hypervascular one, just uh, exploded and shows a significant increase, additional tumor wall uh, nodules, and an even more uh, malignant uh, signal intensity time curve. Having hypo and hypervascular parts of the tumor is not very uncommon. 
And we have seen that before. And therefore, we did uh, so-called targeted biopsy studies, where we looked at the often very heterogeneous pattern of malignant gliomas. And we did targeted biopsies to really look at the vascular density. And we looked at angiogenic factors. And here, we have two air representative areas from that malignant glioma. <clears throat> we have a hypervascular area, which you can see here, histologically high vascular density, and a high expression of angiogenic factors. So high VEGF and HGF. Um, here, that is the histology from the hypervascular part of the tumor, low vascular density, and low expression of angiogenic factors. So this is very important information for the surgeon <clears throat> because of course the target should be to extract and to resect the hypervascular parts of the tumor because those are the parts that recur fairly early and you get a higher grading of the tumor if you are able to extract those or resect those um, highly vascularized tumor parts. On the other side, it's also very important information for the surgeon in respect of his resection planning, because he knows that these areas with hypervascular tumor components will bleed more often uh, and more traumatically <clears throat> as those hypervascular areas of the tumor. So that's important information for their treatment planning, for their surgical planning. But that information about uh, vascularity can also help us in the differentiating uh, uh, paradox of uh, treatment-related changes. Because often, like in this case here, <clears throat> we do see that a patient has very similar anatomic and enhancement findings. Um, either it's a radiation necrosis or whether it's recurrent tumor. So in those two cases, we have very similar anatomic and contrast findings heterogeneous enhancing tumor tissue that recurred, that was growing. <clears throat> if you look, however, at the information about the signal intensity time curve with our contrast enhanced dynamic imaging, we see that this lesion here has a classical pattern of neovasculature. So we have a very steep increase of our signal intensity time curve. Um, so we have high vascularity, we have neovasculature, we have high CBV and a high permeability. Uh, so this is recurrent tumor, also histologically confirmed. This lesion, however, shows more a cumulative pattern of enhancement, which means we don't have neovasculature here. We have more a slow leakage of blood brain barrier damage, uh, which is a clear sign of a radiation induced tissue change or a treatment related change because we are missing the neovasculature here. <clears throat> As said, both techniques add very valuable additional information uh, uh, into our protocols. So the aim was always to combine those two because both are contrast enhanced techniques. Uh, both need an injection. And both are fairly time consuming. And we have established uh, based on a publication, which is like almost 10 years ago now, a <clears throat> protocol where we um, described to do a double injection. So we first inject half the dose of contrast media for the dynamic susceptibility weighted imaging, which allows us to acquire the information about the vascularity and the permeability, but also allows us to saturate the extracellular space, which is important for our patients uh, that have a high rate of enhancement. In those, we knew that we underestimate the cerebral blood volume on our DSC, but that first bolus of injection will help us to saturate the extracellular space and to better calculate the signal intensity time curve, which is then important for us to uh, extract uh, very good CBV and CBF values. So we inject the second time 
for the DSC, uh, DSC scan. And the total dose of contrast media is not higher than what we normally would uh, inject. But you need to change your injection protocol into two injections. So to summarize, <clears throat> perfusion MRI has become a very integral part of our modern neuroimaging protocols. And we use it now on all of our uh, brain tumor patients. Very important is here that we have very good tools to process the data because the data need to be available right on the spot because we want to integrate it into the diagnostic workflow. Uh, we want to include it into the treatment management and follow up of brain and other tumor diseases. The standardized data processing was very, very helpful. And uh, the tool that we are using here, Olea Sphere, is very helpful in allowing us to standardize our processing and not only the processing, but also the reporting, which is essential for the integration of the results into the workflow and for clinical acceptance of those methods. With that, I would like to thank you very much um, for your attention. And if you want to read more about brain tumor imaging, uh, I refer to the book that I produced with Rajan Jain from New York a few years back that gives you all the insights into uh, modern and advanced brain tumor imaging. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your attention. And thank you very much for Olea for the invitation and for hosting that event. Uh, I'm very open for questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Essig. And uh, I have a couple of questions from the chat. The yeah. first question is, uh, I'd like to know which of these techniques have been approved by the FDA as a medical diagnostic device. Um, <clears throat> that's a good question. Um, I'm not sure if uh, the methods are really approved by the FDA. Um, I know that it's used at many, many tumor centers in the US. The contrast media um, that we are using is approved for, of course, brain tumor imaging. Um, the OLEA question, whether the OLEA software is approved, um, I know that it's uh, approved in the US for clinical use. Um, and it's always a combination. It's a combination of the contrast media usage, uh, the tool itself, as well as uh, the post-processing software. Um, I know that we are reimbursed for it and many other centers are reimbursed for those techniques as well. Uh, so by our local authorities, it's approved um, and it's acknowledged and even reimbursed. Thank you very much. I have a second question. Uh, have you got any experience with cest uh, imaging? for brain tumors? And if so, do you think it will be a game changer for multiparametric analysis? Would it eventually replace other sequences for tumor assessment? Um, I, I didn't get the first part of the question. What oh, kind of a technique? It's or about kind of a uh, chemical exchange. Uh, or oh, chemical uh, shift imaging. Yes. OK. Yeah, so there's um, a lot of developments here. Um, there is. Um, a lot of new techniques that are coming up that require um, high field, like there's uh, CEST imaging, um, there is uh, T2 uh, raw imaging uh, and others. So some of them are still under clinical development and uh, still need some proof. Like with perfusion imaging um, and um, like DSC, D, uh, DCE, they established more than for now than 10 plus years. Uh, so we have a fairly good uh, database um, and fairly good experience uh, so that we internally trust uh, those techniques. And more and more over the years, we also get a lot of the uh, histological confirmation. So for example, we say, well, this looks more like a tumor necrosis um and uh, the patient got resected and it was necrosis or the other way around we said it's tumor and it got uh, resected and was uh, indeed tumor we had a, a learning curve at the beginning uh but now it's all very well established but there's definitely new techniques that are coming up uh like chemical shift imaging and um and, and others um that are uh very promising 
uh, related to the use of um, contrast agents. Uh, what is your risk assessment for uh, using repeated injections of contrast agents on pediatric tumor patients? And uh, how would you rate the current alternatives? So, um, like we introduced that dual injection protocol about 10 years ago. We have not seen any side effects with that dual injection protocol. Um, not anything that is different from if you would inject a single dose. Like um, like allergic reactions are very, very rare in gadolinium-based contrast agents. We are using only uh, uh, macrocyclic agents uh, in our center since more than 10 years. Um, so we don't have any patients with NSF or patients with gadolinium deposition in the brain. Um, we don't, with the dual injection protocol, we don't really inject more contrast. Uh, we inject it just different. Um, and uh, giving two injections, one after the other, has no, uh, we have not observed any additional side effects uh, that we would see with a single injection. So uh, for us, it's a very fairly safe protocol to use. Perfect. Um... Do you use OLEA processing for neurosurgery navigation procedures? Um, yes. So uh, <clears throat> we do um, the, uh, the entire processing of our brain tumor patients with OLEA. Um, we have a fairly automated process, which is done by the technologists with a, um, a quality check by the radiologists. Uh, these data um, that are produced are able to be integrated into the neural navigation system. Uh, so we export them and then import them into the navigation system. Um, and the surgeons are actually using those techniques for different reasons. They're using them for a planning procedure, uh, risk assessment. Uh, what was very helpful and a real game changer for them was the information about uh, permeability and vascular density, uh, because that helped them really to predict um, the areas of the tumor that there's a higher risk of uh, intraoperative hemorrhage, um, which they just want it, it. They can't avoid it, but they want to know, uh, of course, uh, they really appreciate that information beforehand uh, rather than uh, having it uh, as a surprise during surgery. Um, yeah, so that's uh, that. Like the, the data is made uh, available for the surgeons. I have a last question. Uh, you mentioned that you use ASL for neurodegenerative diseases instead of perfusion techniques. Can you explain why? Well, <clears throat> the uh, the main reason is that we normally, if we work up a patient with a neurodegenerative disease, we normally don't give contrast media. Um, and um, so just using the contrast media for the perfusion, if we have an alternative, was for us kind of uh, the argument to uh, go with ASL. Uh, on the other side, like, um, the, down, like the, the downside of that is that uh, patients with neurodegenerative disease, they are not the, the perfect patient in respect of um, motion artifacts. So we do see uh, a few patients where we don't have sufficient image quality because of motion artifacts. That's the downside. Uh, however, if we are using contrast media for, let's say, a um, patient like to rule out vasculitis changes and things like that, you can um, use the, uh, the contrast media as well, um, the contrast enhanced technique. And uh, here we mainly use um, uh, DSE, like dynamic susceptibility imaging, because there's no real enhancing lesions that we need to look at. And uh, in respect of a protocol recommendation, if you're using um, dynamic susceptibility imaging together with uh, contrast enhanced MR angiography, I would always do the MR angiography first uh, and then the, um, uh, the perfusion imaging. Perfect. Unless there are other last-minute questions, I would like to thank you for your 
uh, excellent presentation. It was very informative and it was a real pleasure to to be listening at it. And thank you very much to the audience for your questions. Yeah, thank you very much. Have a great and, uh, afternoon. Enjoy the rest of the day. Yeah, thank you very much. Bye. Bye.